Never Quit on a Bad Day. This book is a compilation of short stories uh, by con contributors sharing kind of their, what they call bad day or bad season and uh, what they did to push through through it. So it's been incredible. The feedback has been, you know, um, just so heartwarming that people are reading the book, they're taking action, they're growing, they're, you know, realizing that they're not alone and they're now equipped with some ideas and strategies to help them as they continue on their own life's journeys. Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the Brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia. And for all those people watching us from around the world, it's British Columbia, obviously it's in Canada and Prince George is part of the big province, a beautiful province of British Columbia, and we are 500 miles or 800 kilometers north of Vancouver, which puts it in the middle of the province, north to south, east to west. An absolute beautiful day here. Spring is around the corner, I hope. And then today we have an amazing guest. Her name is Phoebe Trotman. And Phoebe is an entrepreneur and an author in an amazing background in sports. Phoebe, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, John. It's an honor to be here with you today. So Phoebe, you give us a little bit of your background. So I know you're in Vancouver, uh, but tell us a little bit about your past and where, how long you've been there, were you born there, and what did you do, and then you have an amazing history and all the things that you've done as well. But maybe start with telling us about your past. For sure, for sure. I'll give you kind of the short version. We can unpack it as you like. So right. um, I was born and raised in, well, I was born in New Westminster, British Columbia, and then grew up in Coquitlam. And then I, my parents are originally from Barbados, though, so I'm kind of a first generation Canadian, if you will. And I uh, grew up playing a lot of sports. I mean, I've lived in the suburbs of Vancouver most of my life. I mean, I've lived other areas outside of Coquitlam and Burnaby and downtown Vancouver. I even went down to Colorado for a season of soccer and then back up here, but uh, I love beautiful British Columbia. So it's cool talking to someone just uh, kind of in the same area of the world. And so it's great to connect with you and my background. I mean, I've played high level sports pretty much all my life and then transition into the world of entrepreneurship and uh, now as an author. So just like to talk about your sport in particular, you being you're a high level part professional quite near pro professional soccer player and and you you've been very active in that from a very young age tell us a bit about that and and how far did it take you Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm really fortunate. I mean, I started playing soccer at a very young age. I started playing at five years old. My older brother played soccer. And so I was the little sister getting tugged along to the games. And I really wanted to, I guess I said, must have said to my parents, like, I want to play too. And so my parents signed me up on a team. I'm not sure if it was supposed to be a co-ed team or maybe it was just a boys. Anyways, I was the only little girl on this team, little girl, person of color on this team. And I just fell in love with the sport. And so I can continued playing right through. I played club and then when I was in school, high school soccer as well too, then went on to play university soccer. From there, I went down to Colorado and played a season um, of semi-professional. Back then, that was the highest league, basically, first um, soccer in Canada and the United States. So I played in that league. It's called the W League. So I played one season down in Colorado. And then I really wanted a chance to play with uh, a lot of the teammates that I battled against on the field growing up and uh, decided to play with uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps for several years where I had an incredible career there as well, too. So soccer has just created so many opportunities in terms of just connections people have had a chance to meet being able to you know travel all over Canada and the United States as well too playing and also had a lot of high moments winning national championships on pretty much every level that I've played with and just having you know a chance to compete with incredible teammates and learn a lot of life lessons too so I know from your history that uh, when you played for the Whitecaps and for all those people listening to us uh, Whitecaps is the the key soccer club in BC and, and very, very prominent in Canada and internationally. Uh, and you played for the 
women uh, uh, by caps. And I think you were the highest scorer in 2003 with 13 goals. That is possible. I know 2003, I did win um, the W League Player of the Year Award, which was just an amazing um, highlight of, of a career to, to have that honor. And yeah, I just played with some incredible teammates and I, I, loved, I loved every experience. It was such a great experience. Now, I was born in Holland in and, and, uh, 1940, so I'm 83 going on 84. But when I grew up, we played soccer, <laughs> you know, so that was the sport in, in Holland. And then I uh, did speed skating. That was another oh, wow. sport. And then the other sport that I did is uh, judo. And, uh, you know, uh, but the main sport for me was playing soccer. And, and it's an amazing sport because... And what I like about it, I see more and more of it here in Canada. I've been here now 60 years, mainly in northern BC, but it really started 20, 30 years ago where we see more and more soccer being played all the time. And, and, and uh, it's such an amazing sport in terms of, uh, you know, for, from a community perspective and an opportunity perspective for young people in particular and obviously what we have in Canada the first thing that comes to mind is hockey uh, you know which is an amazing sport as well but it tends to be fairly expensive and mm -hmm. and it, it, uh, it, it, it's from a sport perspective uh, for young people in particular uh, but I like my uh, my grandchildren actually uh, 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 my daughter, youngest daughter, Tina uh, and Cooper, they have uh, two, uh, two children, uh, Ollie and Ava, and both of them are soccer players and they are very, very good. And, uh, you know, and, and I love that. And, uh, and, and already at a young age, five, six years old, they are older now, they are in their early teens and, and playing competitively in the school system. It's, it's just an amazing sport for a number of reasons, but I always think is that you don't have to be big for it. It's not hitting each other or hard and, uh, you know, and it's highly technical and, and it creates teams and it gives you, uh, you have to be fast because 90 minutes uh, of running, <laughs> you know, it's, it's an amazing sport. So tell us a little bit about the sport other than what I just said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you highlighted a lot of really, a lot of reasons that I love the sport as well, too. It's just because it's accessible to everyone. It truly is a sport that you can be any size, any background. It really doesn't matter. It's just a beautiful game and it is relatively inexpensive for people to participate in it. I mean, now you have a lot of, there's a lot more, um, extra training and programs that you can do organized if you will however it really is a game that you can just you know you have a ball you can be outside anyone can participate in i mean i went to kenya in 2011 it was a beautiful experience um, it was basically a mission trip to help build a classroom on a school and we were in a very very poor area of um, of in Kenya and they they played soccer they called it football I mean what they literally did you can kind of see it up there actually I'm just noticing there's a oh no over a bit right there um there's yeah. a ball is what they would do is they literally collect bags from around the community and then they'd find like twine and they create their own soccer ball and they'd be playing bare feet and I mean it is one of those games where you don't need a lot of extras to just be able to play. And one of the things I love about soccer is it brings people together, right? It, it's a team sport. I mean, you learn a lot when you're navigating different personalities and everyone's coming together to work hard to win to win the game, right? You have one common goal and that's really to win the game as a team. And the beautiful thing about the sport is everybody is valued in, and you can bring different aspects to the to the game, right? You're going to have some people that are going to be your starters. You're going to have some people who are going to be more, you know, they come in off the bench, make an impact. You're going to have people that are going to be training players. That being said, everybody has a role on the team. And so 
I've just learned so much about people, if you will, in my career of playing, you know, at different levels with different coaches and teammates. And you just, it, it really is like a masterclass in people, if you will, when um, you're on it, when you're on a sport or playing a, a team sport, if you will. Yeah, but you, did, you in particular did, Phoebe, because you, from very young age, you went all the way, pretty much all the way to the top. And, and, and yet, as you said earlier, uh, when I was at Holland, we called it footballing, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it took me a while to get used to soccer rather than the football that we understand here is somewhat different than that. But, you know, it's an amazing sport because it, 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 it teaches a young person or a person of any age, but studying as young people, it's, it, it trains you to be, to be successful. You have to work as a team together. And then the better you get, the more leadership it requires. It makes you agile because that's what makes you successful. It, it allows you to think about strategically, become, uh, you know, interactive in terms with the team and the coaches and, and all the things that are around it. And, uh, uh, you know, and obviously it's extremely healthy, uh, you know, but the, the teams together uh, you know, and then the potential of being successful is understanding mm -hmm. the, the, the team. And then the other part about it is that uh, I kind of think it's so much of uh, Kretzky, the, the hockey player, is that I kind of refer to it somewhat in my mind as, as a, in soccer is because what makes us, you, and, 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 and me and others successful is anticipating what will happen during the game. Where will the ball be? How, and understanding the things that happen around us. You know, it's very strategic. It is, it is. It's a very strategic sport. And also you have to be able to maneuver with whatever you're given, right? And in the sense of it's how do you respond, you know, when you're facing a really talented team, like how do you come together as a team to beat another team that might be extremely talented as well? And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot that you have to learn and, and learn to navigate, right? Communication, you're communicating with your teammates, you know, and your coaches. So you have to learn how to, to deal with, dealing with disappointments, right? Maybe you're not making the starting lineup and you want to be, how do you navigate that? Not making a team. Like there's so many experiences just in my journey as an athlete that where when I look back on it in hindsight, I'm, you know, as much as it was challenging back then, I'm grateful for it because it taught me a lot of life skills. It taught me how to be resilient, how to bounce back from adversities and, and challenges. And had I not been in that situation, it, it may not, I may not have learned that lesson as early on as I did. Right. So I am grateful for, for the tough experiences, if you will, as well as the incredible highs too. Yeah. And then laid down that foundation. Right. And then the other part is that for you and for me, uh, you know, that uh, as we uh, started young and see it developing around us, uh, it, it has become more and more popular, like here, even in Prince George. It's, it's a, a team sport. We have lots and lots of soccer fields here and a lot of young people that are involved in it. It's such an important part of life and of somebody's so social life or developing the interaction between others and communicating. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's amazing. So now you are, are you still a little bit active on the soccer end side, on the football side or? I am. I am. I do still play. I'm actually just coming back from a shoulder injury. However, I do still play on a on a team. It's over 30s or over 35, somewhere in there. But yeah, uh, yeah we still play competitively. And I, I love it just being again around that team. And that's why I say it is a game that you can participate on any levels, any age, like there's opportunities there for, for people to just participate in a sport and get outside. And as you said, just stay healthy and active. Yeah. Now, for people watching us that are, uh, you know, maybe not quite as familiar with it, uh, you know, with the, uh, the Van Vancouver uh, uh, soccer team, uh, the, the uh, Whitecaps, they are in a league that is Canada, but also the United States, right? How, Correct. So the this? Vancouver... Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, I was saying, what is the structure? 
in the yeah, league so that the, they play in? So the Vancouver Whitecaps play in the MLS, which is considered, it's called, that's short for the Major League Soccer. Um, right. So they play, um, yeah, MLS league. So there's teams in Canada, there's teams in the United States. That's the team that the men's play in. Uh, right now, the women's program actually stopped several years ago. I, I, it's It's been many years since they've had a, a women's team that's played. The exciting news is starting in 2025, there will be another women's team, um, a league that's starting within Canada for women and to be able to play uh, at the highest level, which is, is phenomenal. I'm very excited to see that come back because, you know, as, as a former player, it was so much fun being able to play right here at home. Vancouver has incredible fan base and support. And as you said, you know, John Soccer's grown so much over the years within Canada. It's nice for those younger players to be able to, you know, have those role models and mentors and they can aspire to play at that level as well too. And so that'll be starting next year in, in Canada. So why did it, they had it for a period and then it stopped. Why was that, uh, Phoebe? I really don't know. I don't know if I ever got yeah. a, if we got a straight answer as to why. It yeah. was kind of around, you know, I had retired in 2006, 2007 season right. um, is when I stopped playing. And then it was a, it was a few years after that, that the whole league, like, the league shifted and so Vancouver no longer had a team is around the same time that the men entered the MLS in terms of that league. So I'm not sure yeah. if it was something to do with that or how, you know, exactly what happened. It just was, it was too bad at the time they weren't able to continue. The exciting part is it's coming back. And so I'm excited to be able to go watch women play right here in Vancouver. And I know the fans will come out and support the team, all the teams all across Canada. Now, the other thing that we all are excited about every four years, that is the world championship. I think the last one was in 22. Did Argentina win that one or? Argentina did win that one. And yeah. that was a phenomenal game. Anyone listening who know, who watched that game, uh, Argentina versus France, it was just like back and forth. One, an I was very incredible. disappointed because I had hoped that Holland would win, but they didn't fight. They usually have a good team too, though. They do. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They're very talented. To Holland has a lot of talented, hardworking players. So the next one for world champions is then uh, is 2026, correct? Yes, for the men. So yeah, we had there's the World Cup on the women's side. There's the World Cup on the men's side, and so it's always in, you know incredible just to watch people compete at the highest level. I love sports in general, so anytime I can watch athletes compete at the highest level, um, doing what they love, I love to just watch it and support it. And so yeah, in 2026, it's it's coming for the men's side, and I believe that's the year it'll be here too. So definitely, we'll make sure I go catch some games. I love it, you know. So the, the other part, you're also an author, and, uh, and, and so am I, and, and writing books is not easy. And, and uh, I, uh, uh, you know, did, for a long time, people said to me, I already had uh, all kinds of businesses, and I did all kinds of things, and, they, and then had a fairly interesting background, and people would say to me, should I write a book about it? So... And, and so I started about 20 years ago, stop, start, stop, start. And uh, then finally I knew if I didn't do it now, about five, six years ago, then it would never happen. So I wrote a book, uh, Against All Odds, and it's not about how successful John is. It's just the opposite, through going through all the challenges up and down. And so it took me uh, 80 years to live it. Uh, 20 years to think about it, two years to write it, and, uh, and it's an autobiography, and it, it, it's the first one that I did, and as you well know, it's not autobiographies in particular. Once you write it, you can't say, mm, I don't like it, I'm doing another one. No, you get one crack, crack <laughs> that's the one. So I've been very lucky. I'm going to send you a copy of it, actually. I'm going to sign it for you. And, oh, and, amazing. Thank you. Yes. And, and so... Now, with you, Never Quit on a Bad Day is the title of your book. Have you got it there so you can show it to everybody? I do. Well, you can kind of see it in the background over... Where am I pointing? Right I there. See it. I there see it go. on your right side there. Can yeah, pull, there you go. So. Can you grab it and hold it a little bit closer? I can. You know what? I'll grab this one up here. It's a little okay. bit closer. So. Yeah, no, that's good. I love... There you go. And interesting. So... 
I agree with that, uh, but, but so how did you get, so tell us about the book, what, what is it about, and, and then when did you do it, and, and so you have it in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first I want to say congratulations to you, John, for taking action and writing that book, because as you said, it, it, it can be, you know, something, there's a lot of people out there who have it on their heart to write a book, and it, it's one thing to have an idea, it's another thing to take action, and I love that you shared it's an autobiography, and you share, you know, the ups and downs, because that's truly what this book is all about, and it's interesting, because I didn't really have it on my heart to write a book, I always had it on my heart to help to do something that would help inspire people. I wanted to create something, but didn't really know what that was gonna be. And some friends of mine were the ones who said, well, you should write a book. And I've heard that before, and I've kind of you know, hesitated over the years for multiple reasons. However, when they shared it, well, when they suggested I write a book, they sort of flipped it on me. And they said, you know, writing a book isn't about you, it's about the people that you can help. And when they shared it like that, I was open to it. And I said yeah. to them, well, if I'm going to write a book, it has to do two things. Number one, it has to help and inspire people. And number two, I have to feel passionate about what I'm writing on. And so that night I was sort of simmering on the idea of it. And then the month before I had an incredible honor, I was inducted into the Coquitlam Sports Hall of Fame and we had an induction event. And in that the interviewer asked me, what has sport given me? And I shared, you know, some of the stuff we've already talked about, John, in terms of life um, lessons that I've learned on the field. And I shared that I've had incredible highs, you know, national championships on all levels and individual accolades. And I said, however, the only reason I've been able to have those highs are because of the lows, not making a team, sitting on the bench, you know, coming coming off the bench, sometimes not even getting in a game and dealing with all those emotions and learning how to navigate those and continuing to push through is why I've been able to have those highs. And so when I was sort of reflecting on this idea of a book, that's what it hit me. And I was like, that's what I want to write about, the story behind the story. Because oftentimes we see people and we see their highlights and then we're just like, oh, well, that's that's for them. Or they, you know, they don't have it as hard as I do or whatever the stuff we come, the chatter in our head versus actually going, well, you know what? They've had tough stuff that they've pushed through too. Maybe I'm not alone in my own challenges and maybe I can learn from someone else what they did to push through those challenging times. And so Never Quit on a Bad Day, this book is a compilation of short stories uh, by con contributors sharing kind of their, what they call bad day or bad season and uh, what they did to push through through it. So it's been incredible. The feedback has been, you know, um, just so heartwarming that people are reading the book, they're taking action, they're growing, they're, you know, realizing that they're not alone and they're now equipped with some ideas and strategies to help them as they continue on their own life's journeys. So Phoebe, when, how long ago was it that you wrote the book? And so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. So the book came out July, 2023. Okay. So, so the, uh, yeah, yeah, so what I find uh, interesting for both of us, for you and me, you know, having gone through that same process, you know, it's, it's a book that I wrote is, it's not about hurrah, hurrah, John, to the contrary. I feel I have an obligation to share that with people and, and to give them uh, the courage to stay the course and never give up. And, and, and that is important. And, I can see it on your title. So the, the other part about that, just for those that, that uh, and I think it's an amazing experience just thinking about it and then putting it together and starting to write a book and, or, or documenting your experiences, I think is very important is that writing a book is then, it's not easy because then it's not just writing the book, but then how big should the actual physical book be? What should be the title to the book? Because it has to be catchy. I like yours, you know, because Thank it got you. my attention. And, and so the same that I did is this one, Against All Odds. It's, Love uh, that title. Yeah, and, and, and then in my case, I did, should I have pictures in it? And I did that in my book. And where should they be? You know, and what font should it be? And, and a whole number of things come up. It's quite an experience, actually, and uh, I really enjoyed it to do it and uh, to write it. And then the other 
uh, for, for people that write books is that you should, do not become disappointed if you do not get a reaction right away. It takes time to get it into the marketplace. And that's what I found is that I never looked at it as making a small fortune on my books. That's not the purpose of the books. But, uh, you know, to get, to, uh, gradually it's, it's becoming more and more popular. And then once I did one book, then I have other things that I want to talk to people about is that uh, I had an experience. Uh, I was not very successful academically. I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. And, uh, you know, and, and then they said, what are you going to do with this guy? Should we send him to the mentally challenged school or should we get him a career or a job? And so they sent me to a furniture. My parents were beautiful people. They sent me to a furniture factory to become a furniture maker. Now, it mm -hmm. took many, many years later uh, that that's when I was 13. Uh, and then... Kids are hard on each other a lot of times is that, uh, you know, that all the friends that I had been on grade seven and from down four went to college and then to university and I was a laborer. I'm proud of that today, but then <laughs> it gave me some challenges. And then the thing that happened to me is that uh, already I, I left Holland uh, in 1965, July, and went to come to Canada with the dream of building a lumber mill. Oh, wow. And, Good for you. Yeah. And, and why go to Canada is well, we were liberated by the Canadian Army April the 12th, 1945. It made such an impression on me that I always knew I wanted to go to the lands of my hero. And it gave me an opportunity to start from the bottom up with nothing, with no money, virtually three books, a suitcase, uh, two two pairs of clothes, and then I didn't have a job, and I didn't know a soul, and I couldn't speak the language. And, uh, you know, came to Vancouver and got off the the, uh, the train, went to the immigration department, and, and fortunately there was a fellow that I could speak some German, and I said to the fellow, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm going to build, build a lumber mill. He said, go to Prince George. That's where they're building mills, and there's lots of timber, and pulp mills and all the other things. And, uh, you know, so I did that and I've been here now for about 60 years. I have a lumber mill and all kinds of other things. But one of the things that happened to me is that I was always wondering, uh, you know, the, there was something there that, that I couldn't quite understand why I was not overly successful academically. And, and so at one point I walked into a store here and that was, in 19, uh, I was already 57 years old in 1997, January 1997. I picked up a book and I opened the book. The book's title was Driven to Distraction. And I still don't know today even why did I open the book. Written by Dr. Halliwell. It was about ADHD. And mm. I said, oh my God, that's me. And, and mm -hmm. so I wrote it in the book in Dutch. Now I finally know who I am because I was ashamed of it. And oh. then there was still stigma attached to it. Since that time, it has become much clearer about that the frequency of occurrence is, uh, I thought initially from the information that I looked at in Google, you know, that it was 8% of the population that have it. The more I found out about it, uh, uh, you know, the, it is probably more than 20%. And, wow. uh, and, and so, and actually the, the person that wrote the book, Dr. Halliwell, ADHD, uh, you know, he wrote a book in 1993. I bought my copy here in 1997. He's written about 18 books. About five or six of them are about uh, distraction issues. And uh, I had him on my podcast, I think it's 203 actually. Uh, very, very interesting podcast. So when I had him on my podcast, I said that I believe that probably 
bouncing it by him that at least 20% of the population have ADHD? He said, no, John, likely more than 25%. Now, the other thing that was interesting about it is that I always believed that most successful entrepreneurs and, and CEOs, up to, I believe, 50% of them are ADHD. He said, no, John, probably more than 75%. I, I agree with them as well. Because, mm -hmm. and then, uh, so then the other part about it that when I found out about it, it took me five years before I went to my doc because I had to look up Google and I was, I didn't want to speak to anybody about it really because I had the stigma. And I went to my doc and there was a personal friend and lived with my two daughters. And one day I walked into his office and he said, hey, John, why are you here? I said, I think I got ADHD. And so we looked at it and yeah, I do. So the more I talked to, started talking about it and put it, including in my presentations, I felt I had to write a book about it because mm -hmm. I, I, had, I started to meet some people in, in particular, uh, you know, the, I, I was making a presentation East, uh, Best of Prince George one time to a group of people last year. And, uh, and when I was sitting in the hotel the night before and was having dinner by myself, uh, a fellow came up to me and said, uh, I, like to, I don't want to disturb your dinner, but uh, before you go, I'd like to ask you a question about your book. I said, sure, I'll come see you before I go. So I went over to his table and he said, I had sent a book and I'll show it to you in uh, 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 ADHD Unlocked. And uh, I, I gave out a lot of these books and also to a city council and the counselors. And he was a counselor in one of the cities close by. And he said to me, when you send me that book, my son at 15 years old has been really troubled by ADHD, has ADHD, and it's really giving him issues. So we, I got your book and we read it together. And I mm. said, oh my God, you know, and, and it changed the things that he did. And it had, that has happened so often to me since and, and still, uh, you know, my book has become very popular, actually, even internationally. And, and so it goes to the point, uh, uh, Phoebe, that uh, saying that I'm writing books, not just for the purposes of saying hurrah, hurrah, John, but if it can help others or enlighten it, uh, you know, because ADHD uh, directly to do with attention, uh, also slow learning or the, 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 the attention issues also affects people with trauma or other ones that have other difficulties or challenges. This book helps them in that process. It's an interesting book. You, you can start it anywhere, go forward or backwards. It's always interesting. And, and that's kind of written with an ADHD mind. So that then, when I started writing books about it, so I did that one. And then while I'm on it here, then I did, I did another one too. And I find so often that, and, and you're again a perfect example of this, is that a lot of people don't like what they're doing. Uh, they say, oh, I hate my job. I said, change. You know, life is too short. But if you don't like what you're doing and you go home, you take that with you and then it affects your whole life. You know, change. And, and, or uh, if I make presentation to young people, uh, a lot of times in colleges or universities, I said, uh, okay, so what direction do you want to go in a career? And they say, I don't know, you know. So my recommendation is, and that's what I did, is that uh, even when I was young, I want to be a CEO or an entrepreneur, and then I, I want to find different people that gave presentations, inspire me, in terms of what they did and how they did it and what made them successful. So that's what I said to, uh, you know, the young people or the students uh, in presentations. Uh, you want to be a truck driver? Talk to a truck driver. If you want to be a carpenter, talk to a carpenter. If uh, They will like to talk to you. You want to be a lawyer? Find out what lawyers do and what is attractive and where are the challenges or a doc or 
or for that matter, an entrepreneur or an author, right? So, so I wrote a book about that is, uh, you know, finding your passion, uh, living the dream. And mm. uh, so, to, <laughs> and then the fair question is, say, hey, John, are you living the dream? I sure am. Even now mm. at 83, nearly 84, you know, so I'm living the dream. I love it. And so then I did one more. The other one is very important and obviously is part of your life is that uh, it's not age, uh, th that's just a number, but uh, it's the quality of life and saying diet and fitness is, and mental fitness is, as well is very, very critical. So I'm writing a book about it. It's coming out in the next three months. Living Young, Dying Old. That's me. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Good job. Yeah, so uh, so I'm uh, bodybuilding. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, is uh, you know very important, uh, and I've been uh, every, everything. Every so often, that happens, something happens in your life that is kind of a trigger. And I had uh, you know when in two thousand and eight, uh, and obviously I was already sixty eight then. Uh, you know, the, uh, I got a case of diverticulitis and uh, mm. that nearly killed me actually and uh, came that close, uh, ruptured. And uh, so then I'm, I knew I had to be a bit more conscientious about diet. And then uh, I would go for fitness like a lot of people do, like myself, uh, you know, Every year, and we say, okay, I'm gonna next year. I'm gonna do this, that, this, that, and the other thing, and then go to the gym. Well, do you buy the membership for the gym? You go for two weeks, and then all of a sudden, you can find a hundred reasons that you're too busy. But I became very serious about it, and uh, you know, in in terms of diet, my wife is vegan. I'm probably eighty or ninety ten, uh, and and then started to go to the gym with the trainer. That works for me because. It's an appointment. And I did that for about six, seven years. And somebody said to me, uh, have you ever thought about competing? And uh, I said, hmm, I don't know, <laughs> you know. So, and then I got into competing and uh, did that on the Northern, here in Northern BC, came in second and third, uh, bodybuilding and physique, did it in Vancouver actually for the provincials, came in third in bodybuilding, second in physique, qualified me for the nationals and the Arnolds. And, and then COVID came. Now I'm training again to go back to the Arnold's in 2025 awesome. at 85. Good for you. Good Makes for me you. the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America. That is incredible. Congratulations. So, so I'm going to send you copies of these books and I'm going to sign them oh, for you. you. The other one is not out yet, but, uh, but, but I like, uh, you know, and uh, I like to, once you start writing and, and then start to get the feel of it, it's, it's really enjoyable. And especially in areas like what you did is that, uh, you know, the, uh, with the title Never Quit on a Bad Day, uh, you know, it's, it, the title is catchy and, uh, you know, and, and I like it, you know. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And yeah, my goal with it was because that saying I heard, you know, years and years ago, and it really applies to all areas of your life, right? There's going to be those challenges, there's going to be bumps in the road. And it's important not to quit when you face those challenges to push through them, get to the other side. And then if you need to transition or make a change, then you do it from a place of of peace, if you will, and positive emotion versus when you're, you know, those, what we call a bad day, what some people might want to label as a bad day often is because we're in a place of negative emotions. We're frustrated, we're disappointed, we're discouraged. And that's not usually the best time to make a decision to quit something. It's, you know, get through it, get to the other side and then evaluate that decision. And so my goal with the title is whether someone ever gets the book or not, that when they hear that title, it sticks with them. That saying never quit on a bad day and they use it and apply it to all the areas of their life and just the magic that happens when we push through those tough times to get to the other side is incredible. Yeah, the, the other part that I did about the book, and it was a new experience for me as well, I did audios of the book as well. And, and so uh, 
And, and then uh, I've always find it amazing, especially when I'm podcasting, I usually, the books come up somewhere along the discussion. I find it amazing how many people are actively working on either uh, writing or, uh, you know, being interactive. I find that uh, podcasting, uh, uh, I started about three, four years ago. First was kind of blogging, then started on Shaw, you know what Shaw was, the, you know, the mm -hmm. television channels and do it on a local basis. And then as we did it more and more in the region, it's always amazing how, mis how many very, very interesting people live in the area. And uh, so we did that for quite a while. And then I thought, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, then we got COVID obviously, and then we could not use Shaw anymore. And then I had this apartment here, downtown Prince George. And so we had uh, developed a studio in here. And, and uh, so that worked well. And then I thought, mm, again, finding more people, I thought maybe I have to set up another studio in, I have an apartment in Yale Sound, maybe in Yale Sound. But the more we thought about it is saying, how about virtual? And virtual at one point was more difficult. If you watch CNN or one of the other ones, you have two or three screens together and it, it, it is now virtually seamless. Like you and me sitting here, it feels like we're in the same room. Totally, totally. It's beautiful. And you learn to pivot and adapt, right? That's part of moving forward with life. Yeah. And then the other interesting part about it, Phoebe, is that, you know, we can sit here, have a discussion, and, and all the people from, uh, you know, it's not just you and me, but tens of thousands of people can be watching from around the world. And what an amazing media, because uh, now uh, we are a member of Podmatch. And, uh, you know, so in, in, in the last number of probably a year, six, eight months or so, and uh, so we are interviewing people from, interacting with people from around the world. Mm -hmm. Last week I had somebody from Greece, I believe, uh, uh, several people from the United States, somebody from Peru. I think next year we have uh, somebody from, Ch uh, next week somebody from China, from all over the place. And, Beautiful. And, but an amazing vehicle to interact. Yeah, it really is powerful. And I think that's one of the beautiful things with technology is you can access resources and connect with people all over. And you had said something before about in one of your books that you teach people to connect with people. You know, if someone wants to be a doctor, go connect with a doctor and find out what it's like or a lawyer or whatever profession someone wants to go down. And I was like, you know, I heard a saying success leaves clues, right? So find someone who has a life that you would like, you know, there's things about their life that you like and ask some questions. A lot of people are very open to sharing, you know, or get their book or listen to their podcast or go to a live event. Like there's so many resources out there that we can tap into to really continue to learn and grow and pick up ideas and strategies of how to live our best life and create that best life. And so I love when you shared that about how you talk about that in your book, because that's something I often share as well too, is find someone who has what they want. Again, success leaves clues and mimic what they did. And you'll, you, you know, if you follow the same recipe, you're going to get the same result as long as you follow it. Oftentimes exactly. I think we kind of change things out and we're like, ah, I don't really want to do this over here. I don't want to do this over here. Well, then you're not going to get the same result. But if you ask those questions and you implement, then you, you know, again, success really does leave clues. Yeah, no, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, and then even with these platforms now, the, uh, and virtually in particular, podcasting is still on its infancy. It will still go much further. And uh, if I kind of look back uh, to where I grew up in Holland, uh, you know, people were doing a lot more interacting. And, and, and over time, in, in particular, uh, you know, now uh, there is less interaction, but this possibly is the vertical in which we can become part of other discussions 
from around the world. And uh, I think it steps into that place. That's what makes it so popular. I agree. I agree. The amount of people that you can connect with, you know, again, as you said, we're sitting here and in, in, funny enough, we're in the same province. However, I'm like, I've been having conversations with people literally around the world because we're able to now connect and then you can learn from other people. And that's what I think is so beautiful is especially about podcasts and YouTubes and, and, you know, having those resources is everything. It really is at your fingertips. You're able to get access to it learn the basics and then as you evolve and grow then you might need to look at hiring coaches or mentors or attending different events and coaches and things like that however there's a lot of information that we can access right from our fingertips yeah no no question about it and uh and it makes the world much smaller uh, you know the the other part about it is that uh you know and and uh is that i grew up in holland in in a difficult period uh, you know, the Second World War. I was born in 1940, 45, and things were fairly difficult in that part of Holland where I'm from, in the extreme northeastern corner, 10 minutes from the German border. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the uh, things were difficult at the time, uh, uh, you know, the difficult uh, in 1944, 1945, it was. Uh, uh, the hunger winter in particular, there was no more food, had been cut off, and it was the coldest winter on record. And, uh, and then looking around, uh, you know, the, the world and, and living here in Canada or in North America, uh, I fly a lot, around a lot. We do a lot of business in the United States, but in Canada, every time I sit in the window, I used to sit by the window in a the, in the plane. I look outside, I said, it's paradise. It is paradise, you know. We are so fortunate living here. I'm not so sure that people always fully appreciate that, but I've had the experience in in another region and 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 war, and uh, you know, and and let there be no illusion for a lot of people that uh, that they think that once there is a war, once the war is over, everything goes back to normal. It simply doesn't. It, it may take a generation, sometimes more than that, uh, you know, before things settle down to a sense of normality in those areas. And some of the families that are being uh, affected by it, it will never, uh, you know, get back to the same that it was before. So appreciating, uh, you know, the what we have here in the democratic countries, uh, uh, you know, is, is very, very important. The other part, uh, watching the news and being sensitive to the world, seeing things going on in the Ukraine and, and then in the Middle East. And then sometimes I look at the United States and, and, and dic the, the, the chances of dictatorships, uh, you know, and, and uh, they ca came really very close to that. And I'm not political, but I always think it's scary to think of uh, our system, democratic countries uh, like us are, uh, uh, you know, flawed sometimes, and it's not always well, but it's better than the alternative. And uh, especially if I look at uh, Russia, Korea, Venezuela, and, and some of these other places, uh, uh, you know, where there is dictatorships, uh, you know, where people are struggling and have very little income, really. We are very, very, very fortunate in Canada in particular, and I love this country and, uh, you know, and, and all the opportunities that we have. Absolutely. There's always something to be grateful for, you know, and I think that's a big um, component that when people really start to embrace gratitude in the little, it, it, it multiplies. And it really does start with just finding something to be grateful for every single day. And uh, one of the things that I've realized, especially over the years, is when you do start to embrace gratitude, again, it doesn't minimize the challenges that we're going through. It just allows us to have a bit of a shift in perspective. And sometimes it is that shift in perspective that we need to be able to see clearly to make that next step forward, whatever that might exactly. look like. And really, you know, you're not really able to be angry and grateful at the same time, right? So no. one of those is going to win. So if you focus on the gratitude, it does just open up and allow you to see things with fresh eyes, if you will. Yeah. So and then looking at your parents and their background down the Barbados, uh, you know, I've been there and it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful 
uh, island and, and beautiful area. So are you going still back there? Have you still got family there or? I do, I do. I have a lot of family still there. I love to go to Barbados. Typically I go at least once a year. Um, I have actually for the last oh, 10 years or so, sometimes fortunate enough to go twice. And I just, I love being there. I call it my, like the moment the plane touches down, it's like, I just feel this sense of release and comfort. And uh, it's just, it's such a beautiful country, the people, the food, the beaches, you know, so I always recommend to people go to Barbados, put it on that list and put a date on the calendar and make it happen. I love it. And it's so such a friendly uh, mm -hmm. country and the people are so amazing. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, it's uh, very, very beautiful. It is. When were you there last? How long ago? Have you been one time or you've been more than once? No, I've been uh, twice, actually. One time uh, that was quite a number of years ago, probably more than 20 years ago. And then once we stopped, uh, we were on a cruise of the Caribbean mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and stopped by, uh, by, by just then. And uh, so, Beautiful. but uh, I, I always kind of look forward to again doing a cruise or uh, go again there. I, I love it there. You know, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. It really is. It really is. So if you look forward, uh, you know, like for yourself, uh, maybe. So what do, what do you see uh, uh, you being still active in uh, quite a number of things uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in the Vancouver area? So uh, you still do training. Uh, you know, what other things do you see for yourself? Uh, in the future yeah absolutely so i actually oversee a program for kids playing soccer so three to seven years old uh, it's a great program that we run here in coquitlam with uh, coquitlam metro Ford soccer so continuing on with that and then also i'm working on the next book so when i started um when i kind of had the vision for never quit on a bad day when i first started mapping out my vision for the book it, it kind of grew from there where i realized it wasn't just one book it, it's a planned series of books so i'm actively writing right now working on the next one very very excited for this next one which um yeah that'll be coming out in the next couple months here and so excited to continue to help people and inspire them and just give them some insights and, and things they may not have thought of to help them and really equip them on their own journey and really just because i believe when everyone just starts living their passion they start um accomplishing their goals and dreams it just helps other people in their network and in their community feel like they can do it too and then that's where that ripple effect starts and continues because when one person steps out and goes like yes i want to do this and they do it naturally other people around start to be like well if they did it i can do something too and so i just believe it's that powerful ripple effect that goes from there and so i'm very excited for the next book and uh yeah just continue to uh build the brand and get the word out there about it and celebrate people and their accomplishments so what is the next book about have you got a title already or uh yeah, so it's going to be within the Never Quit on a Bad Day series. So the title right. is still Never Quit on a Bad Day, Inspiring Stories of Resilience. This next book is going to feature stories from accomplished athletes. So it's, um, again, just their journey, a little bit about something that experience that they had that was a challenging one and what did they do to push through. And so the book's written, you know, this one and the next one are written in a unique way where every chapter has like a story. And then there's a section called Reflections on Resilience, which is really for the reader reader uh, to think of some reflective questions and there's usually a, there's a lesson in there that challenges the reader to kind of reflect on their own journey to help them move forward as well in, in what they're going through and so I've been working on a lot of the reflections on resilience right now and just there's some powerful lessons in the stories that um, some of the, the athletes are sharing and I'm yeah, just very excited for, for it to, to hit the bookshelves if you will. So the other thing that I do is, uh, you know, I'm still working on another book that's not quite done and then another mm -hmm. one. So I do that. And then, uh, you know, are you doing any presentations or keynote presentations? Uh, you know, because you've got such an amazing story and then Thanks you're you. a good speaker, or a good presenter. That's obvious. Uh, you know, you. so uh, 
uh, and, and I am. Create. Yeah, I do have. I've had some people reach out, so I've booked a few events that I'll be speaking at, as well as doing some workshops uh, mm -hmm. for different uh, individuals and groups. And so, yeah, excited to continue on with speaking and just helping people, really. So, um, some of them are smaller workshops, and then some of them are larger events that I'll be speaking at as well throughout the year. Yeah, so I find that uh, interesting to share, uh, you know, the experiences, uh, you know, in, in and, uh, you know, and, and especially these days, I believe it is so important to get the exposure to somebody's background and especially like you. So, uh, so the key for that we leave is the people as we getting to the end of our podcast is uh, never give up, uh, always give it, uh, you know, the, it, I have a little plaque here that uh, you know, that is uh, 2547. That's what I had in my pocket when I came here uh, from wow. Holland. Couldn't speak the language, didn't know a soul, and uh, didn't have a job. But, but uh, the employees made this for me, actually. But what is the foundation for me is attitude. Uh, I will always, you know, no matter how tough it is today, it will, I, I always say tomorrow will be better. And then the other one, passion. I always, when I do something, I give it 150%. And the other one is work ethic. Nobody works mm -hmm. as hard as I do. And, and so, and what I usually do is I get up at 5.30 in the morning and I always think I'm late. And, and, and I'm always making my bet. And every day is a good day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because it's perspective, right? It's, it's having that perspective. And that's incredible to have that and to know what you've been able to accomplish and how just you going after your goals and dreams, how that inspires other people and to have that reminder there with three incredible principles to, to live by and to fuel you is, is exceptional. So congratulations to you. You had an amazing journey and you're continuing on. I love that you're working on your other books right now too. And the same for you, Phoebe. And I'm gonna Thanks. send you copies of these books. I'm gonna sign them and we'll send them out. And, and this podcast uh, is available tomorrow morning. Thank you so much, John. It's been a pleasure connecting with you. Yeah, let's stay in touch. You know, so be Absolutely. so close. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Let me know next time you're in Vancouver, we can grab a coffee and I'll make sure I mail you a copy of the book as well too. I, I like that. Thanks, Phoebe. You take care. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.